For one, I've always wanted to be a recording musician. What inspired me about recording was, again, I made a connection with Joel Smith years and years and years before he ever knew who I was. And I did that through record. And long after Joel is gone, he's still here, thank God. But long after he's gone, I'll be able to take this music and pass it down. I'll be able to share it with somebody that's not here. And somebody's gonna do that with me. And that's what I want. I want the legacy of my drumming. You go to a concert of a guy, plays a tour, you know, it may be the greatest tour ever, ever in tours. If you weren't there, you missed it. If you're on wax, it's, nobody can take that from you. No one can take that from you. Yeah. The history and the legacy that you leave is here forever. And that's kind of what I wanted to do. I wanted, I wanted to be a part of the history of drumming and I wanted it to be able to be passed down. Today, our guest is the one and only Calvin Rogers. In the world of gospel music, Calvin is widely regarded as a modern day living legend and at only 40 years of age. He began his career essentially at the age of 15 when he made his first national recording with Ricky Dillard and New Generation Chorale on the live CD video, Hallelujah. After graduating high school, jazz icon Ramsey Lewis invited Calvin to join and record with his award-winning supergroup, Urban Nights. At the same time, Calvin was touring with gospel legend John P. Key, as well as working as a first-call studio session drummer in Chicago. Eventually, Calvin received the call to step outside of the gospel world and into the secular world, where he did a long tenure drumming for R. Kelly. After his tenure with R. Kelly, Calvin found his way back to his roots and began working with Fred Hammond, Israel Houghton, and the Isleys. Calvin recently made the switch to minor cymbals, and when he did, people freaked. I knew he was a big deal, but I didn't realize just how much stock people put into what Calvin said and did until I watched social media have a field day when Calvin announced his switch to Minel. So now we have him in Nashville, Tennessee to film video content and to sit down for this podcast. Calvin, welcome. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Minel Symbols. Thank you for having me. Man, thanks for being here. Dude, you just like complete, I don't like to use the word crush, but dude, you just crushed three tunes. <laughs> Man, that was killer. Thank you, man. It was, it's a ton of fun. It's a great studio here. And uh, I'm just so excited about these cymbals I'm playing. I just couldn't stop hitting them. <laughs> right on. Well, man, we're going to launch straight into it. Um, yeah. So I, I came up with a list of questions for you here. And I think the first two questions could actually be sort of like you just put them together and you can, and you can tell me what you think. Great. So there's a lot of people who are going to listen to this that know for sure what gospel drumming is. And then there's going to be a lot of guys who've heard of it, but really don't have any kind of foundation for understanding it. So from your point of view and your experience, can you tell us what gospel drumming is and also what it's not? Um, well, I think I, I'll, I'll answer the questions in reverse. And um, I would like to say what gospel drumming is not. It is, it's not a, um, for me, and for the drummers that have influenced me, it is not um, it's not about skill. Skill is required. You have to be skillful, but it's not about your skill. It's not about uh, your it's not about your playing. It's not about your chops. It's about your ability to what it is about is it, it's about your ability to um, maybe I'll say to transfer uh, a feeling and a belief from your heart to your instrument and therefore outward. Uh, for me, being that I am a Christian, uh, drums is, or music is always has been a form of worship for uh, myself. It's an expression. It's an offering for me. So what it is for me is uh, it's just a way for me to translate uh, how I feel about uh, the many blessings in my life and how I feel about uh, whatever it is I'm thinking of at that moment. Uh, it's an expression for me. It's and it's it's communication. Um, and for me, it's again, being that I'm a Christian, it's my offering and it's my prayer to, you know, to to God. And it's, it's my, you know, my gratitude to him. So that's what it is. Gospel drumming is a about, I think it's about the feeling you get. And it's, it's moving. It's about how you uh, express your, uh, your your gratitude, you know. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, 
can you give everybody a history of gospel drumming? Uh, I mean, like, really, it's interesting because people say gospel drumming, but where does that come from? I mean, I think we, you, one could guess, but yeah, tell us, fill us in. Yeah, I, I would dare to say, like, you know, when you talk about gospel drumming, actually, when you talk about gospel music and drums, it, it, um, gospel was almost the last, it was, it was probably the last music to introduce drum set into music. Um, uh, it was, uh, there were a lot of churches. And again, you said, uh, you, you brought up my age, I'll be 40 in November. And uh, sorry, no, no, no problem. <laughs> I'm jumping the gun. <laughs> I'll be 40 in November. And I am old enough to remember when every church did not have drums. Really? Yes. In Chicago, which is considered by many the gospel capital. Um, but I'm young enough to remember the, the first church that I played in, the first church where I had a job at about eight or nine years old, um, did not have drums every Sunday. Uh, they had drums once a month, and I you had to bring drums. What was the occasion to have drums once a month? It was a particular Sunday. So on fourth Sunday, they would have drums. But why? Like, what happened? On, like, why was fourth Sunday the day? I'm not to have drums? really sure why it was that <laughs> Sunday, um, but that was the Sunday that was chosen where wow. a drums and and they not just drums. Uh, this church, this church is this, this church is somewhat of a landmark. It's called Liberty Baptist Church in Chicago, Illinois. It's on 47th and King Drive. I'm saying like big pipe organ, grand piano. Uh, it's very a traditional Baptist church. Um, the pastor was Pastor D Z Jackson, so he was connected to Martin Luther King and things like that. Uh, so that church it, it has a lot of history, but um, that church was very traditional. And so not only did they bring drums in, but they brought in like drums, synthesizer, a bass player and a saxophone. And were, uh, like were other drums section. around that. Sorry to interrupt, but I got to ask before I forget. Were yeah. other drums around the U.S. or excuse me, were other churches around the U.S. doing this at that time? Or was like this the first one? No, this wasn't the first one. Uh, my home church where I grew up had drums. OK, but in um, so in gospel music and, and in the Christian world, there are different forms of churches. There's a you know, you have traditional Baptists, you have Methodists, you have uh, full gospel, you have Church of God in Christ. Well, traditional Baptist churches were some of the last churches to kind of embrace that mm. that thing that was going forth. So, and this was a church that my father worked at, and so that's how I kind of got into playing drums there. But to answer your question, um, I think James Cleveland was one of the first. Um, I, I, I'm really good friends with a guy that started out playing bass with James Cleveland. He's considered like the godfather of maybe tradi uh, traditional gospel music. His bass player, Andrew Goucher, said to us before that a lot of times they would pull up at concerts. They were playing churches. There were no drums in these churches. So and this was in, you know, maybe the, the early 60s, you know, something like that. Uh, you know, maybe early 60s, early 70s. There were no there, there were no drums in, in some churches. So gospel drumming went from there to, you know, to to, to James Cleveland. And um, it was around the time where Andre Crouch introduced a lot of introduced a lot of gospel um, love, lost a lot of gospel music lovers to uh, more um, m musicians that were kind of like acclimated doing other things. So Andre Crouch, which is he was a phenomenal songwriter and artist, and he was very, very large. Um, he had the likes of Joe Sample and Abe Laborio, uh, Bill Maxwell, all of these guys kind of came out of that camp. And, and not came out of the camp, but they worked with him as well. Andre Crouch did like his 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 group did the background vocals on Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror. So he was very large. He was well revered in the gospel world, um, very renowned. But, you know, he introduced us to a lot of music. And from there, we got into the likes of Bill Maxwell and Joel Smith um, Derek Schofield, things of that nature. And that's where we saw kind of the progression of the gospel musician gaining, you know, acclaim. 
And then you had a lot of gospel musicians who also became artists because you had the likes of Marvin Winans uh, and Fred Hammond, who was a bass player for the Winans. So I have to ask real quick, though, um, you said that uh, in the early 60s, churches, a lot of churches didn't even have drum sets in the church. So what about gospel records that were being released at that time? You can still, yeah. Did they some, have drums on the album? Some of them don't. Okay, some so of them don't. Andre Crouch may have been like the first guy to I, start. I would dare to say that 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 um, that James Cleveland was to start introducing yeah. drums on records. Yes, probably because some there are some like Thomas Dorsey records, or um, there are some Thomas Dorsey records where there are no there are no drums. Who were, so? Them. Who would you say was like the first drummer? that got really noticed in gospel drumming back in the day when that got introduced on albums? I would have to say it was maybe Bill Maxwell. He was the drummer for uh, Andre Crouch. Between, I would, I, would, I would dare to say between Bill Maxwell, Eddie Bayers, who's a Nashville guy. Eddie actually. Bayers? Eddie Bayers really? played on some Hawkins albums. Ah. Yes, he played on some Hawkins albums. But Eddie Bayers, Bill Maxwell, and then you have where Joel Smith enters and then... There's a whole school and uh, generation of musicians that come behind him. Yeah. See, and that's interesting. So when you bring up Joel, the next that's who Sput. When I was talking to him about this, picking his brain about the history of all this, yeah, he, he brought up Joel and said, "Go listen to these Hawkins albums." Whew. And but then the next guy he referenced after that was you. He said it goes from Joel, and then. He said it goes to Calvin. Calvin's the next like link in the chain. <laughs> that's that's flattering. <laughs> it's very flattering. Um, uh, I think you know the reference to Joel was just because I kind of picked up the mantle that Joel um, had kind of built up, which was Joel worked with everyone. Everybody wanted to work with him. You know, he just he was all over the place. But I mean, says and, he's a bass player. He's and he's a bass player. I was getting ready to say, you know, he, this guy was he was juggling schedules between playing drums. He was a drummer with the Hawkins, but he would double as the bass player with them. But some albums people would hire him to play bass. Some albums people would hire him to play drums. So um but he was a great recording musician. Um and I think that the effect he had on the gospel community, uh is um as heavy as it is, I think a lot of times when people make the reference to him and myself, it's probably just about the level of influence that maybe a drummer has had. However, I have to say that there are so many drummers in between there that, you know, to me, there's no, when I think about Joel, I don't have anyone to reference before him. I don't really know. I mean, he talks about Derek Schofield. He talks about his time with Bill Maxwell. He talks about Eddie Bayers. Bayers. Um, but you mean Andre Crouch talks about that? No, no, Joel Smith. Joel, okay, sorry. Joel, because because Bill Maxwell played on some Hawkins albums. He played on a couple of albums, and he worked in the studio with him. Joel knew Bill Maxwell, and Derek Schofield was another drummer that would play with the Hawkins. Eddie Bayers, of course. So he spent a lot of time with those guys, but. There was no reference point for him. The the initial recording, the, Until I Found the Lord, is a song that Joel Smith is playing drums on. It changed every drummer's life in gospel music, but he was 16. What was it about that song that changed every drummer's oh, life? Man, you'd have to hear it. It's it's the intro. The intro of the song is a, is a deep, heavy groove, and it's, man, it's it's groovy. It had never it's, been done before on it, record it had in, never, in gospel? That world? had never been done before. And then the way the groove changes from, it goes from a strong, like, like goes from a strong groove with like four on the floor to like a church shout beat, which sounds really fast and uh, yeah, a tempo. Yeah, super so it's, it's so it's basically it basically turned into like double time, right? You know, so it went from like but when it went to that, Joel had this thing that he was playing like on kick drum and he's playing all the syncopation on the on, on the ride cymbal and the bell and 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 splitting the syncopation between the ride cymbal, the the bell, and the kick drum. And that was just something that hadn't been heard. And mind you, this guy's 16. I'm saying that to say, before that, you didn't really hear that in gospel music. In my case, 
there are so many references where you can I feel like you can listen to my drumming and you can tell where I picked things up from. Um, but with Joel, you know, you, do, you would have no point of reference. You, there's no point of reference. Which, and, you know, it's just what was in him. So, you know, um, some of the things I have done in my career, people feel like, you know, man, this changed my life. And a lot of times people say to me, this is what made me want to play drums. And that's exactly what happened with Until I Found the Lord. I was a drummer from the day I was born. But the moment I heard that song, everything changed. Who put that on for you the first time? You remember who introduced it? I put it on my, for myself. So every Saturday morning, I used to sit in front of my dad's record player. He had a humongous record collection. And I would just go through those albums and put them on and sit in front of the stereo and just air drum to them. Um, and again, I was listening to the likes of, you know, again, Bill Maxwell. There was, uh, I believe, um, Butch, I can't believe, remember Butch's last name, but he was James Cleveland's drummer. Uh, there were some of the guys from Detroit that were doing like Clark Sisters and Wine and you got Michael Williams and things like that. They hadn't really come along yet. Um, this, this is like early 80s. So, uh, but one particular Saturday, I just remember it like it was yesterday. I remember what I did every Saturday. And one particular Saturday, I pulled out this album um, and it's Love Alive 2. And this song comes on and the intro, I immediately hear the intro and they, uh, Joel starts, Joel Smith starts the song and it comes in and it's all drums for like eight bars. But when this song comes on, I'm like, yo, what, wait, wait a minute. Like what's happening? And this song just arrested me. It arrested my entire body, I could not move. I didn't air drum. I didn't blink. I didn't breathe <laughs> almost. I was just, I was just like paralyzed and I was locked into this thing. And I was just like, that is what I want as a kid. I was maybe seven years old. And I'm like, this is what I want someone to feel when they hear me play. Yeah, sure. That's what I, I'm like. I'm listening to that and I'm and it just grabbed me. So and I wanted people to go. I know what I want to do now. And that's just what I was saying, because that's what it did to me. It made me go. This is what I want to do. Well, man. So, I, you know, I have to ask you I appreciate your humility when you say there's a lot of, you know, Spud says, yeah. hey, the next guy would be yeah. Calvin. And I appreciate your humility when you go. Yeah, there's a lot of other guys, too, mm -hmm. that are there in between Joel and me and and um but, you know, I've, we've got some other guys who have said the same thing about yeah. you guys like uh, Spanky yeah. have, have said the same thing about you being a, a modern day living legend. And it's interesting. I mean, you're only 39. So, yeah. Um, but you got your start pretty early. Yes, I did. Which accounts for why you've done so much at such, by such a young age. So yeah. what now we're going to have I'm going to have to ask you to step outside your uh, humility box here okay. <laughs> and, uh, and just go ahead and pat yourself on the back. Now, I want to know. What do you think um, your the praise these guys heap on you could be attributed to? What what have you technically brought to the art of gospel drumming that brought it to this next step, this next level? What's your contribution? Um, my contribution is I, I think I put the music first. I I try not to play anything I don't feel. Um, I, I try not to play anything I don't feel. My dad was my greatest influence. He taught me everything I know about drums. Essentially, what my dad did was he was a musician and he was all around the city of Chicago working with artists. And basically what he did was every drummer that he worked with, he picked things that he liked about them and then he beat me up with it. Hmm. And he just made me into his favorite drummer. What was his instrument? My dad played guitar and keyboards hmm. and he was a songwriter. And so uh, he just basically like he made me into his favorite drummer. And so, um, but he always, he was, he was hard on me, but only about showboating. He told, and his thing was, you don't want to play for people, man. Play what you feel, play what's in your heart, play what you feel the music calls for, you know, let the song get inside of you and then play it from that perspective. And so for me, I think what a lot of people hear is just like, man, I, I love, I, I love the drums. I love them. I love everything about them. You know, I, I just, 
I still, I'm 39 years old and I still sometimes just, I walk past drums and I'm like, I just got to sit down. I like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be in my basement working or doing something and I'll, I'll go over by my drums and I'm just like, oh, I got to sit down. You know, <laughs> just, or I just got to hit it. You know, I just got to touch it. Um, I, I just love, I love the drums. I love music, but drums are, man, they've been there for me, you know? So technically, if we're going to say like, what your contributions were, technically speaking, on the ground. How does it look on the ground? Because, again, I had a really fascinating conversation with Spud mm-hmm. about the history of all this. And he said, in a technical sense, you stepped things up a few notches. Well, and I took that to mean, like, maybe the technicality of it Yeah. All. Well, because uh, a lot of us were just a, a lot of gospel drummers. You know, we were just kind of playing what we feel. And then as I was getting older, when I was getting as I as I got older, I started wanting to learn more. I didn't want to just, because I just played what, whatever I heard in my head and I just, and then I, I got to, I got, got to high school and there was a, I went to a performing arts school and I started learning about reading music. I hadn't taken any lessons up until the time I was 14 years old. I hadn't, I had never taken drum lessons. So, um, but getting, learning how to read music and now you're getting into the technical side of things. And so kind of what I did was I, I kind of gave guys, I, I gave guys the 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 the, uh, the push maybe to 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 get into the other things of music, learn about other styles of music, learn about jazz, learn about Latin. And the thing about it is, see, with gospel, you don't necessarily have to go and study that music because gospel music embodies all of that. You can play a gospel. I can reference any style of music you want to any genre of music you want to bring up. I can give you a gospel reference. Gospel music has every genre inside of it. So a lot of times you won't have to necessarily go and study that music. You could just man, you can get by with playing a a, a gospel reference and be like, oh, that was less Latin, you know, or that's rag a or that's blues. Because well, that makes sense because gospel just like. It, it encapsulates the African American experience. Yes, which absolutely. That music is. It's from it's from all around the world. Yeah, which is what jazz is. Yes, yeah, that yeah. came from the African American experience. Mm-hmm. Hmm. It's like a living kind of a living history lesson. Yeah, it is. And so, I but but when I got to school and I started, I started meeting other musicians that knew all this all all of these kinds of music but necessarily weren't from gospel they started you know sharing it with me and started you know having me study it and then now I'm I'm studying jazz and um I've got a natural gift but I've got guys going okay let's let's work on really you know honing your craft and not just being a guy that just can play but a guy that can read a guy that can understand what someone goes well you know do you know what the one drop is for a reggae tone you know or uh a a, a true um latin um groove you know a merengue you know what i'm saying any of those things so i kind of started just studying that stuff and getting into it and then I, I had you know rudiments I was learning rudiments and balancing my hands and things like that which just a lot of us weren't doing we were just all naturally gifted and so what happened was a lot of the guys you know got into that as well when when I they started seeing me doing it you know because some of the stuff I was playing wasn't just now it wasn't just like oh no he's not just playing he's there's some technicality behind that there's, he's playing some rudiments you, so, you know what I'm saying so you brought you brought a level of technical proficiency that gospel drumming had not seen yet maybe not on the mainstream level I'm sure there was you know there there were guys again you know Joel is well studied and he's well versed and he knows everything he's playing you know and there were a lot of guys but I think at the level and and for my generation I'll say for the guys that were coming up with me or behind me I I brought that level of playing and introduced that into us because now I'm in a lot of guys started getting into jazz you know yeah. and you know and I have a lot I, I have so many guys uh, a friend of mine plays is playing with Joey DeFrancesco now, and he's like, "Man, dude, you're you're one of my heroes." And I'm like, "You're man, are you kidding?" But he's a serious jazz musician. But you find out now, so many of us now that are coming from the church are finding our way in other styles of music, serious styles of music, and being able to really live in that world. Yeah. So, you know. Well, you mentioned a little while back in the conversation about Chicago 
um, that's what you would call home base for gospel drumming? Yeah, I would. And uh, because you hear I would about- call it the home base for maybe gospel music, period. But I mean, when you talk about you talk about drummers, I mean, it goes from the West Coast and it goes from like Oakland Bay Area to, you know, to to L.A. Then you got, you know, the East Coast and then you got, you know, Midwest, you know, so you got Philly, Philly, you know, which, you know, you got a lot of those guys. So, you know, in the beginning stages, you know, again, again, you had Joel and you had the guys that were playing with the Hawkins. Then you had the guys that were doing a lot of the session work out in L.A. Then you had the guys that were doing the stuff in, in, in New York with like Hezekiah Walker, or which is where Gerald Hayward started. Um, you got. You know, guys are, are coming from Jersey, Philly, New York. Then you got the Detroit thing. The guys that play with like the Hawkins and the Winans and the Commission and the guys that branched off from that. Then you got Chicago. So you would say that simultaneously there were churches that started putting drum sets in there yeah. all around the same time. All around the same time. Okay. And like by the, by the mid 80s, you know. What was we, what were the what were the primary sources of rhythm? Before the church found its way in the drum set, was it hands and feet? Foot stomping and hand clapping. Tambourines? Were they? Tambourines, washboards, but I, I, most of it was just like foot stomping and hand clapping. Yeah. And that was part of uh, shout music? Yeah. Originally? Yeah. Um, you had a high profile touring gig with R. Kelly years back. Yeah. When was that? What were the years? Uh, that was around 90, I think maybe around 2000, between 2000 and. 2002, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Spent a couple of years with him. Spent a couple of years with him. How is business in the secular world handled differently from the non secular world? Hmm. Uh, it's a lot more shrewd. In which world? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. Yeah. I have to be honest and say, you know, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be down my church people. I don't want to be down my no, gospel guys. No, this is a negative But, but a in, a, in, in an honest way, you know, a lot of times you do gospel music and people just, they don't want to say what it is. In the R&B world, they just tell you what it is. You know, they'll go, listen, this is how much it's paying and this is what it is. You know, gospel will go, hey, can you do it for this? And sometimes you say, okay, I'll do it for that. And then it's, then it's like, well, when do you get it? Or, you know. Why do you think that is? The gospel music is just, you know, a lot of us, again, uberly talented, overly talented, uh, but uh, not very business smart. And gospel music, uh, even though it's a, a style of music probably everyone listens to maybe at some point, uh, it's, not con- it's not big business. So are you saying that the guys that agree to do it for a certain amount are undereducated about what they should be asking for? Or are you saying that they're I'm the, saying, are you they, saying that the guys that offer the money are a little more shrewd than the guys in the I'm saying it's both. The guys that are the getting offered the money are undereducated about what they should be getting, but also the people that are offering the money are uneducated about what, what they offer. what to offer and what they should be getting, you know. Mm. Um, the record business is a very shrewd business. It's very real deal. It's a grown man business and people, I don't care what kind of music it is. I have seen record company people that do, that are putting out record gospel music, abuse and take advantage of people. And that's, they're, that's just the business. Yeah. And it, it, it is business. You know, people do, do bad business. Some people do good business. Some people are shrewd businessmen and there's nothing wrong with that because at the end of the day, there's a bottom line, you know, and that's what people are looking at. Um, so I think business for me, the business of it was, I just kind of always knew up front, like, this is what it is. And I get a lot more of that now. It was weird because I remember after playing with R. Kelly, the conversations people had with me changed. Hmm. The way they approached me about working with them changed. Uh, How come? Because they felt like you had a more higher profile name or because they knew they couldn't mess with you? Uh, I don't want to say people felt like they couldn't mess with me, but I feel like people thought, oh, he's worked with R. Kelly. He's been to another side. He's used to being business being done a certain way. And so when people would approach me about working with him, then 
I, I really remember conversations, how people approached me changed. They, they were just up front. They would, people immediately would come to me. Usually money would be the last thing that would be talked about. Now, after a while, it would be the first thing it would be talked about. You know? mm. So do you prefer to stay in the non-secular music business now? And if so, why? No, I, I, um, I still do some secular. I play, I still play with the Isleys and, um, I, what I don't ever want to do in life is be bound to anything because of a check. So I kind of go where my heart leads me and where I, where I, I, I want to go where the music is fun to me. I want to go where it's inspiring to me and hopefully the, it'll be enough for me to take care of my family still. I've been able to do that. I don't have a problem with secular music, but um, I just, you know, I spent some years playing with R. Kelly and, you know, um, there was not a lot needed for me as a drummer, as as his drummer. I was needed to, like, count the songs off, get through some of the segues and just play on top of what was already there. Um, I enjoy playing drums. I still do. And so... You know, even getting older, you know, you want to uh, you, 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 you your playing start just starts to change. You mature as a drummer. You start to enjoy things like space and simplicity and, you know, things like that. But I still want to enjoy playing the drums and I still want to feel like I'm making a contribution. So it's that's why, you know, I never really I didn't really chase the R&B thing, the secular thing after I played with R. Kelly. Uh, a lot of my friends were going, well, your next move is to move to L.A. and, you know, find another R&B gig. And I I didn't want to do that. I didn't. Mm-hmm. So I enjoy, you know, I, I, secular music's cool. Some guys really flourish at it. They're really, really good at it. Um, and they, they know how to make it work and they enjoy doing it. It's just not my bag. I think it's easy to get lost in that world. Um, Always I, chasing the next R&B gig, next pop gig. You know, I think... If that's what you do, if you're chasing a gig, then yeah. Um, I don't try to chase. Again, I'm not a gig chaser. Mm. I've always, for one, I've always wanted to be a recording musician. Um, What inspired me about recording was, again, I made a connection with Joel Smith years and years and years before he ever knew who I was. And I did that through record. And long after Joel is gone, He's still here, thank God. But long after he's gone, I'll be able to take this music and pass it down. I'll be able to share it with somebody that's not here. And somebody's going to do that with me. And that's what I want. I want the legacy of my drumming. You go to a concert of a guy, plays a tour, you know, it may be the greatest tour ever, ever in tours. If you weren't there, you missed it. If you're on wax, nobody can take that from you. No one can take that from you. Yeah. The history and the legacy that you leave is here forever. And that's kind of what I wanted to do. I wanted, I wanted to be a part of the history of drumming, and I wanted it to be able to be passed down. No, I totally get that. Um, okay, so that brings me to a question I was going to say for later, but it's, it's kind of related. So I've seen... I saw somewhere online, there was some website that noted this, that um, they were hanging with you at a, a show or two, and they noticed that you were recording yourself at the gig. <laughs> and um, what what is it when, I mean, most guys would record themselves so they could listen to it afterwards, and they can decide this or that about their drumming, they can learn from it. What's it that you're listening for when you record yourself? Um, it could be a number of things. That particular uh, tour I was on, I was the band director for that, you know, so I'm going just going back every night. Of course, I'm listening at myself play because uh, as a band director, when you're the drummer or as a band director, period, your instrument is almost the last thing you deal with. You, you know, making it around to the drums was the last thing I did as a band director and trying to figure out what I was going to play and things like that. So, um, of course, I'm listening to myself, trying to see how I'm feeling about what I'm playing, making sure that I'm not just being repetitive, making sure I'm not, you know, being predictable. Uh, but I'm also listening to the arrangements, you know, and I, I, I still, as, as, as long as I've done it, I've, I always want to grow. 
when I go on tour, I always the thing that excites me about tour is I expect to become back better than I was when I left. I think that when you're playing every night for three or four months, man, you should. I mean, every night at, at a at a at a high level, you should absolutely grow. And that was that is what would uh, what motivate me about going on tour. I was always motivated about I was always like excited about knowing that I should be better. When I got back, mm-hmm. I expected to be playing things that people hadn't heard me play before from touring, you know, yeah. so that that's that's what I would be doing. I would be recording, you know, myself, I would be recording the show and, you know, I'm not just recording just drums only. I would be recording the entire show. But a part of it is me listening to myself, seeing what I can make better about me, what I can be doing differently, how I can be taking a different approach if I can come from a different perspective on the music. And then also what I, what's happening uh, band wise, if I'm hearing something in arrangements, if I'm missing something from one of the one of the musicians, something I want them to be doing or something I want to be catching with them or something like that. I love it how I'm sure for you, it's a no brainer to do something like that. It's a positive mental exercise you should always engage in. But to somebody out there that's uh, still just working their way up through learning their instrument, they probably think, oh, when I get to that level, I'm done. I made it like I can just go on tour. But obviously the learning never stops. And that is the worst thing you can do to go, oh, I made it. And then you just like now I just sit back and wait for the calls because drumming is ever more day by day like basketball. (laughs) You know, um, when you're 30, people are looking for you to be hanging the shorts up. There are maybe four players in the NBA, maybe four, I think. I don't know if Vince Carter has decided to play again. I think Dirk is going to play again. I think Tony Parker, maybe one more. I'm a huge basketball fan. I think those are the only four players in the NBA that are 40 plus or 39 or 40 plus years old. It is a young man's sport and drumming is becoming more and more by the day a young man's game. But what makes uh, what what keeps you in the game is your expertise, your um, your maturity, your wisdom, your knowledge, you know, things that aren't necessarily here in your hands. But up here in your brain, you know, a lot of times that's what people hire you for at this point. You know, a lot of people, people hire me for what I can play, but they also hire me for the way I think. And so, you know, that is. um, But but man, you have you can't ignore how music is changing and how drummers are changing and what they're doing and the way they are changing the game. You know, so um, I I definitely I make it a, a I make it a. um. I make it a thing to make sure I'm listening to the young guys and seeing what they're playing and trying to figure it out, whether I can use it or not. Yeah, no, it's (laughs) killer. Um, I I got a couple more questions for you before we wrap up. So um, I I don't want to beat this one too much into the ground, but I have Mm -hmm. to ask, do you think people hold you to a different set of um, ethics, maybe a higher ethical standard because you play in the gospel world? Uh, Yeah, I, I think they do. I think they hold... Everyone who is uh, in involved in the gospel community to uh, a, a certain standard because it comes with some saying you're a Christian comes with a moral expectation um, and saying that I'm a Christian as well as a musician, you know, uh, comes with some uh, comes with moral expectation. People expect a certain thing from me um, and I, I'm not perfect. And I don't know where people get the misconception that if you're a Christian, you have to be perfect or what what is considered perfect, right. because everyone has their uh, their definition of what they think is perfect. You know, and I just think, you know, it's about being the best me that I can be. You know, I read the Bible and I pray and I just believe this is my, my duty is to be the best me that I can be for all of the people I'm connected to. So you're not scared of the uh, unspoken challenge. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not scared of it. I had, it, you know, I'm 40 and I'll be 40 in November. And I'm just like, listen, I, I got tons of bills and I got kids in college. You know, I'm, you know, I, I deal with me. I, I, I deal with me and you should deal with you and whatever you, whatever your perception of what we are, 
you you deal with it from that perceptive and from that perspective and I'll deal with it from mine. Yeah. You know, I don't mind uh you know, some people they expect you to not to do things or not to say things or not to be seen doing things and you know, for a while you buy into that. And then after a while you're just like, man, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You know? that's, yeah. If I want to have a drink, I'm going to have a drink. If I want to have a glass of wine, I'm going to have a glass of wine. If I want to have a cigar, I'm going to have a cigar. And that, that doesn't make me any less Christian. You know, I've, I, I've met plenty of Christians who don't curse and who don't drink and who don't smoke, but they do tons of other things. Oh, yeah. You know? So it's like, you know, this doesn't make you not any more Christian than it does me. You know, and like I said, it's just really about what makes you the best you that you can be and sharing that with the world. So my last question for you is for someone who's an admirer of, of your career and has ins- been inspired by you musically, what's the biggest takeaway that you'd like for them to have? You talked about how uh, you, your body of work has been committed to, to wax. And so when you're long gone, someone can look at what you've done. And what is it you'd like for them to, to take away from your body of work up to this point so far? Up to this point so far? Uh... It would be a couple of things. Set goals. You know, I would tell guys, you know, set goals. I I had a, a long list for years of artists that I wanted to be on record with. And I would check them off. It was a, in a paper spiral notebook. And I'd written out every list, every every artist that I wanted to work with. And I, I checked them off one by one. Um, set goals. Um, you know. Practice. Be committed to your craft. Be committed to it emotionally, spiritually, and financially. Uh, You have to invest in your gift. You got to invest in your craft. My dad taught me a a lesson very early in life. He bought me my very first drum kit when I was eight years old. But he bought me a drum kit, and I had two toms, a floor tom, a snare, and a hi-hat. And he said, anything else you get, you're going to have to work for. So I had a church gig and I saved my money and I bought my first cymbals, but I played on those drums for two years, maybe more with just a set of hi-hats, no crashes, no cymbals, no ride, no anything. That's awesome. For And, and my dad, you know, and I practiced every single day on those drums and I would go play at churches. I would play at concerts with humongous drum kits and all kind of gear. And I would come home to these drums and it was just like, and I, it would be easy for me to say, I'm not going to play those drums because they don't have the things that the other drum kits that I play have. But I came home and I played those drums every day. And then when I was ready, I saved up money and I bought my first set of cymbals. I bought a set of cymbals. And so I think you should you should invest, you know, time and money into your gift. But I think the one thing, if nothing else, I would want people to take away from from what I've done so far is that I did. I was only motivated by the music and not by anything else. I wasn't motivated by the women that I could that I could bag. I wasn't motivated by the money. I wasn't motivated by YouTube clip or the YouTube uh, uh, hits or Instagram follows or DMs or any of that. I was only motivated by the music. I, everything I did essentially came down to one thing. It was about the music. And I think if you go from there, if you make it about that, then you, you got a great place to start. Dude, I love it. Calvin, man, thank you so much. I thank love you, having man. you here in Nashville. I love having you sit down and talk with us. And I'm sure everybody else out there is going to dig this also. Thank you to Chris Brewer. And thank you to this wonderful symbol company that has completely changed my approach to drumming at 40 years old, finding a whole new, a whole new sound. It's exciting and it's refreshing. And I thank you guys for having me here in Nashville. I can't express how excited I am about being a part of this family now. Thank you to you guys. Thank you, Calvin. Thanks for listening to Minel Radio. If you liked this episode, please head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. We would appreciate it very much. Thanks, and we'll see you soon.